Hello and welcome to the print soft cover. We have with us Nicholas Brooks. Nicholas' latest book, An Island's Eleven, is out, and we are here to talk about it. I right, welcome Nicholas. Welcome to the print. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, uh, first of all, let me be uh, very precise. I have read a few chapters of this book and I really like the kind of writing that I've come across. It's very simple, lucid and flows like at places. It flows like poetry, honestly. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I really liked it. So thank you for oh, that. Thank you. My very Thank first question you. is, at the very beginning of your book, you say that, uh, you know, even after you have written this 500-page chronology of the Sri Lankan cricket, uh, you say that it's just a starting point. And, uh, uh, and you also mention a slew of writers who have come before you and tried to document uh, the game on this island in the subcontinent. Uh, why do you say so? Well, why do you uh, feel like it's it's a job that has just started to you know it's just started? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the first thing to say, Anurag, is that compared to lots of the other major cricketing nations, if you look at somewhere like England or you look some at somewhere like India, and um, the whole cricketing canon that exists for those countries really doesn't exist for Sri Lanka. I mean, I started my research at the MCC Library at Lourdes, and you can um, see it in a beautifully physical way there, where, I mean, you know, England is three columns, India is three columns, and then you get to Sri Lanka, and it's this tiny little um, stack of books, uh, most of which are inaccessible, out of print, uh, very hard to come by. And... Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was hugely indebted to the writers, the few writers who've written on Sri Lankan cricket before me. Uh, so, you know, people like S.P. Fonanda, S.S. Pereira, Michael Roberts, um, of course, Shehan Karunatilaka and Andrew Fidel Fernando. Um, and also, you know, there's a few writer cricketers, guys who've, um, some of the guys who've played in England, like Garmini Gunasena and Churchill Gunasekara, you know, provoke, um, produced really invaluable texts, but in the context of the cricketing world and what other nations have had written about them, um, there is just a tiny, tiny amount written on Sri Lankan cricket. And I think the other point that I made about it being a starting point is, um, you know, I only had 170,000 words to work with in this book to cover 130, 140 years of cricket history. And I mean, my first drafts were a lot bigger. I had to cut a lot out and uh, trying to deal with 130 years in not a huge amount of words. You have to kind of brush over everything. And there are a lot of stories, a lot of things that I wanted to delve into deeper that I had to end up leaving. And so that was really what I meant when I said that this work was just the starting point. And, right. um, I mean, I, 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 what also uh, uh, like wondered me is that uh, you, we all... Uh, no Sri Lanka, most most people know Sri Lanka, especially in the subcontinent, post-1996. That's when that's when Sri Lanka actually arrived. But you have gone back five decades. You have gone into uh, you know era when 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 the cricket in that country wasn't recognized. And then in the 60s, when probably one one odd victory, one odd draw. And then, and then in the 82, 83, when Sri Lanka got its uh, test status. And so wh why do you think you had to go back, go back five decades? Well, I think that those are some hugely important periods in Sri Lankan cricket. And I think that uh, I was very struck by the fact that a lot of people have sacrificed a lot to keep the game going on the island. I mean, especially this small group in Colombo, which really was the game's cradle. And um, I think I certainly felt that without the sacrifices of the guys who came in, you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, Sri Lankan cricket might not have existed, might not have been in a place to get test states in 1981 and to go on to win the World Cup in 1996. And I mean, especially talking to some of those cricketers, guys from the 60s and 70s, a lot of them, I think, felt almost as though they'd been written out of history and that their contribution to Sri Lankan cricket had um, been sort of negated and ignored. And I think that's really sad. I think they did a lot for the game 
I think there was some huge talents there. And there's an argument that to be made that Sri Lanka or Ceylon, as it was then, might have got test dates a lot earlier. Um, that especially if you're looking at cricket criteria alone, perhaps they were ready from the 30s or the 40s. Uh, certainly they could have got it in the 1960s when I think they were let down by uh, administration kind of bickerings and right. the lack of interest. Structure. Well, that's uh, something that's that that still continues with uh, with with Sri Lanka and and the game and the, the game of cricket in that country. Uh, the yeah, uh, but uh, you 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 start your book uh, with a very fascinating account of uh, of 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 what later came to be known as Murli Gate, and uh, you go back to 1995. And and if we look back at Sri Lankan cricket's history, that would be probably uh i mean the 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 lowest would we call it the lowest point of uh, of, uh, of of sri lankan cricket from purely from a pa fans point of view yeah absolutely i think you have to look at that certainly as one of the great nadirs in sri lankan cricket and uh something which fascinated me throughout this project was kind of this idea of triumph through adversity it right. felt like through the whole course of Sri Lanka's history, it's had to battle just incredible adversity. And um, yet somehow adversity and triumph always seem to go hand in hand. And I mean, you know, what, three months after Murali Gate, Sri Lanka won the World Cup Absolutely. against all odds. And I mean, you know, even in between Murali Gate and that triumph, you had the central bank bombings, which was just another hugely scarring uh, incident event which devastated Colombo. So, you know, Sri Lanka's always had to struggle through uh, huge amounts of adversity, both on the field and off the field. Uh, Boxing Day 1995, you know, people forget, and it's very difficult to kind of reconcile in hindsight that at that stage they were still a total cricketing minnow who were, you know, fairly unused to television do coverage. Think, uh, do, do, you, do you think, and while you were documenting for this book, uh, researching and uh, uh, did you uh, ever feel at any point in time that uh, the Western cricketing lens was a little too harsh on the Island Nations game for its players? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think throughout Sri Lanka's history, I felt that, um, you know, England, uh, I think it's fair to say, had a pretty paternalistic relationship towards Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, even after Sri Lanka won the World Cup in 1996, you see them arriving for a visit to England in 1998. They're given one test at the end of the summer, you know, tacked on to the end of a South Africa series, kind of still treated like a second class cricketing nation. And this is the world champions you're dealing with. You know, Sri Lanka have to wait until 2001 to get a full three test series in England. Uh, in terms of Australia, I think it's a bit more nuanced. Uh, you know, Australia are often held up as the kind of bad guys in yeah. Sri Lanka's 1996 quest, the sort of... Um, you know, they're the villain in our hero's story, but at the same time, they were the ones who gave Sri Lanka the but, Sri Lanka. But, but that did, but those those limited, uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunities to play quality sites, that, that did have some ground for it. Because if we look at Sri Lanka's performance uh, in the one days, in the shorter formats, and then we look at their performance in the longer format of the game, there is a there is a huge difference disparity so how do you how do you see that like don't you think the decisions that uh, the uh, some uh, some of the established cricketing nations took uh, towards sri lanka when it comes to playing them on a regular basis or a full fledged five test series or three match test series uh, one day according to you also based on the performance of the side of the sri lankan side uh, I think perhaps initially, but I think what we saw was that in the wake of that World Cup triumph, you know, 96 led on to, especially, you know, that uh, probably those first years of the 2000s, I'd say, uh, Sanath Jasuriya's tenure as captain and then into Maela's tenure as captain. We saw Sri Lanka growing into a really successful test side. Um, you know, I think in 2002, they won eight tests on the bounce, which was a streak that's only been bettered by... Clive Lloyd's West Indies and Wars Australia. Um, and yet I still felt like they got short shrift um, in terms of scheduling, that they were never quite welcomed into that uh, team of big boys, whether that's, you know, partly due to economic factors as being a smaller island, being late to the party. I'm sure all these things played a part. 
But yeah, I do feel that um, Sri Lanka were never quite given the opportunities that they deserved as a test playing nation. But then there's also, I guess, the other side of the coin is that um, they have traditionally travelled poorly as a test team outside of Asia. And, um, you know, you'd say that they're one of the test teams who are more comfortable in their own conditions than they have been in um, what we refer to, I guess, now as the Senna nations, South Africa, England, New Zealand, Australia, of... um, not always been the happiest hunting grounds for Sri Lankan teams. So more often than not, they they have uh, had to struggle for their due, snatch, and uh, maybe uh, some of them, some of the players, uh, also brought the aggression to the field. And and in in one of your chapters, you you talk about uh, the World Cup winning captain Arjuna Ranatunga, and you you sort of say that his arrival changed the culture of. Uh, of cricket, of both administration, administrative and also the kind of cricket Sri Lanka was playing. So what exactly was the norm before Ranatunga comes in and, 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 and how did he change it? Would you, would you be able to tell us a bit to our viewers? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think uh, the first thing to point out is that, you know, cricket in Sri Lanka is very tied to colonialism and it started at uh, sort of anglicized schools founded by, you know, old Etonians that were for a kind of upper middle class urbanized anglicizing citizen. And that I think throughout Sri Lanka's history, there'd been a kind of fealty to all things English, to the MCC rule book, to playing the game the proper way. And that's both uh, in terms of cricketing technique and a sort of uh, moralism, you know, a kind of this gentlemanly ideal of playing the game the right way, uh, which, you know, is certainly noble. But I think that by uh, the time Arjuna Ransunga takes over as captain in 1988, I think off the top of my head, uh, you know, the world's changed, cricket's changed. It's become a pretty different place and you've got um, a lot of sledging going on. You've got, you know, it's a professional context. And I think in hanging on to that sort of gentlemanly, uh, you know, lose with a smile on our face, don't say anything back kind of ethos, Sri Lanka were sort of allowing themselves to be bullied. So I think in that sense, Ranatunga brought brought a bit more steel into the spine. He said, we're going to stand up for ourselves. We're going to give as good as we get. And, um, you know, we're not going to be pushed around anymore. But I think then he also embraced a bit more of the Sri Lankan spirit in terms of uh, ingenuity, invention, uh, dynamism. You know, I think that uh, anyone who's been to Sri Lanka will know there's a kind of madcap tropical hedonism about the sort of collective character, I think, that shines through very strongly. And I think that Arjuna embraced that. And you see the kind of cricketers who come through sort of around him. Uh, I, you know, I think of the likes of Murali, Merlinga, Ajanta Mendes, Dilshan. These are some of the sort of most revolutionary cricketers uh, who've emerged from anywhere in terms of the way of doing things differently. Well, and... That's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, in a way, is, uh, is looking back at the talent uh, uh, Sri Lanka produced. And, and, and you also mentioned that uh, the, it, it, it's it's fine to accept that uh, Rantunga was a dynamic leader. He brought his uh, own to the team. But in a way, he was also lucky uh, for he had a continued supply of quality players, both on the batting and the, on, on the bowling, bowling side. So uh, uh, do you think uh, it was a burst of talent for a decade or so or, or a decade and a half that kept Sri Lanka going after 1996? And um, do you do you, do you think that uh, uh, because you you say that uh, uh, in one of your uh, chapters you say that the first class system in that country is broken. That's the word you use uh, for the first class domestic cricket in Sri Lanka. So do you think the rise that Sri Lanka saw? Uh, that's one side of the coin. But on the other side, there was a failing uh, domestic circuit, domestic system, and cricket administration that. Uh, sort of fail to uh, produce quality players uh, by putting in place systems of efficiency? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
what's actually sort of ironic or counterintuitive is that the first class system now is probably more broken than it was in 1996. I mean, prior to 96, Sri Lanka had no money, uh, but the lack of money meant there were less kind of uh, less complicated issues. And, you know, club cricket was much smaller. There were less first class teams. There were stronger squads uh, and that kind of, the smaller system in 1996, I think, was more effective than it is now, uh, where club cricket seems to be in a really tricky uh, place. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going on there, really. Um, but so I think also you're right to say that Sri Lanka were blessed with, I mean, an extraordinary generation of talent. And I mean, you look at the likes of, I mean, I think Jayasuriya, Aravinda, and then they were followed by Mahela and Kumar. Atapatu, Dilshan, Samara Wera, uh, you know, also guys like Hashan Telekaratne and Roshan Mahanama. I mean, you know, just the huge, uh, the depth of batters that Sri Lanka had. And then, you know, at the, on the other side of the coin, you've got Murali and um, Chamindavas. And then there's always, you know, you don't need that much to back up when you've got two stalwarts like that. Um, so no doubt there was a golden generation, but I I feel Sri Lanka has always produced um, quality cricketers. Maybe we're seeing a bit of a shortfall of batters now. Uh, but yeah, that, I think that failure to adapt, uh, I've often heard people in Sri Lanka say that they think the attitude was, we gonna, we were good enough to win the World Cup then, what needs to change? Um, right. But I, someone put it to me as like the analogy of... Um, you know, I've got a, uh, in 1999, I had a Nokia 3210 or whatever that could make a phone call. Uh, but it doesn't mean I should still be using that in mm -hmm. 2023 when everyone else has got an iPhone. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a little bit of that about the Sri Lankan system. Um, the, a failure to adapt, a failure to modernize and professionalize. And um, also, I guess, problems that happen when money floods into a game, when it becomes potentially prey for people right right so during uh, the course of uh, the investigation that uh, you or your, the research that you did for this book uh, what stood out for you uh, what's ailing sri lankan cricket for a game that's so popular in that country uh, for a game that binds uh, millions in that country together that brings them together and it, it's it, it's a game that has brought them together Every time there has been a crisis in the country, even as late as 2022, uh, with the with the uh, economic crisis that's uh, that's still ongoing uh, in in the island nation, uh, a bunch of 11 men they sort of come together and give give something for them to uh, to 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 feel good about, to feel proud about, to rejoice. So how is it that something so close to the Sri Lankan population, Sri Lankan people, is still broken? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a complicated situation, Ryan Rag, and it's not easy to kind of find uh, straightforward answers. I think probably the first thing that I'd tell is hugely historical, which the way that Sri Lankan first class cricket developed as opposed to all the other major cricketing nations is different because it's founded on clubs, right, rather than territories. So say in England, every sort of county or major county has its regional hub. So you've got um, in Yorkshire, there's Headingley and Lancashire, there's Old Trafford. In Birmingham, it's Edgbaston. Um, whereas in Sri Lanka, with the system founded on clubs, they're all basically in Colombo. And so you've got this kind of crazy situation where three of the biggest first class sides, the NCC, the SSC and the CCC, they're all actually located on the same road. Um, you know, it's Maitland Crescent, right in the heart of Colombo, has mm. these three cricket clubs, bang, bang, bang. And I mean, in terms of tapping talent regionally, when all of the cricket is so Colombo centric, it becomes very difficult, right? And so you have this situation where Sri Lanka hasn't had a national cricketer from the north since 1969. And, you know, um, then. I don't think any national cricket has ever emerged from the east coast of the island. Of course, you know, that spread was also uh, sort of destabilised by the civil war. But I think in terms of geography, Sri Lanka is still a long way from uh, tapping its full potential. Uh, I think there's 
kind of another uh, structural issue is that you know the cricket that's played with bat and ball and pads and boundaries is really the preserve of a very privileged few right. uh, and most of the island plays softball right you know, you gather in an um, in a street or on a beach, and you've got your tennis ball and your bat and your mm-hmm. fielders. And, um, and look, we've seen uh, Marlinga come from softball. We've seen Jaya Surya, who did play, you know, schools cricket, but I think his uh, training owed a lot to the softball game. And I wonder whether enough has been done to kind of tap the potential from softball you know there's huge softball competitions in Sri Lanka and I think that more could be doing to try and you know find that as a source of cricketers uh, and then obviously another thing that's held Sri Lanka back massively in the past few years is kind of administrational malaise uh, the sense of um, I guess a lack of long-term planning when you've got kind of boards that seem to be on a carousel you know people are jumping on and jumping back off there's been factionalism the idea that maybe one administration doesn't want to continue um what the last administration has started uh you know we've had lots of um government appointed interim committees and you know, all, think... of the, all of that all of that has uh, has had a direct impact on the performance of the team well, uh, Nicholas, you, uh, if I'm, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you document uh, cricket in that country till 2022, 20, 2021 or 2020, something like that. Uh, but uh, Sri Lanka has played a good amount of cricket in the last uh, one year or so. Uh, there has been a new crop of players that are making uh, news. Uh, some of them are, are, you know, coming up as good all-rounders, good batters, uh, uh, even even the captaincy has got some hope in in, in 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 the new new captain the country has how do you see their performance from here because last year they they, they in, in september 2022 they won the asia cup but in two months in just two months time they crashed out of the t20 t20 world cup so this sort of inconsistency that's that's something that has been characteristic of the sri lankan team for some time but but do you think this is something that should actually worry them uh, because how, how do you see this this level of inconsistency? Um, I think the inconsistency is certainly a worry, especially um, amongst the batters. Uh, I think there are guys there, you know, Kusal Mendes, Charith Asalanka, Banuka Rajapaksa, you all, uh, you see innings by those guys and you think that they have the potential to be world-class on their day, but then they fire and they don't fire. Um, I think probably the first thing to say is that it was a huge surprise winning the Asia Cup, an incredible kind of story for Sri Lanka, given all the turmoil that they've been going through. Uh, But I think that that was a performance which exceeded everyone's wildest expectations. And so the regression that we saw at the T20 World Cup probably wasn't as um, sort of drastic as it looked uh, I think that was more in line with how people had expected Sri Lanka to perform. But I think there's reasons... But because, to be because, because, because uh, as we talk today, uh, yeah, the third week of, uh, fourth week of January, if we have had a recent series in India where you uh, uh, must be aware that uh, the, the Sri Lankan board uh, had asked uh, the Sri Lankan team management to come out with a report uh, stating the reasons for the 317-run loss they had against India at uh, Thiruvanthapuram. So uh, all, all that is happening that, that goes on to show that uh, all is not well uh, with the Sri Lankan cricket board or the players, what kind of messaging they are uh, receiving from. So, But uh, despite all that, do you see this current crop of uh, players uh, excelling uh, in going into the World Cup because the World Cup is, is barely eight, nine months, eight months away now? Look, I, um, I'm i not going to sit here and say that I expect Sri Lanka to win the World Cup or even get to the final. But I do think that um, there's a lot more positivity and a lot more cause for optimism than there was, say, 24 months ago. Mm-hmm. I think um, on the bowling side of things, you look, there. there's options there, right? I mean, uh, Hasaranga has done great in the IPL and has shown himself in white ball cricket to be a world-class leg spinner. Uh and I think he can do more with the bat that he's, than he's shown. Um, 
And then, I mean, you look at the pace bowlers that you've got. I mean, Dushmanta uh, Chamira has done really well. There's, um, you know, uh, Dilshan Madashank has come out of nowhere, left arm kind of sling bowler, and has shown he can be really successful. Um, Maj Patirana, who we still haven't seen that much of, but he's had chances for CSK and the IPL, has done really well. You know, you've got guys like um, Kasun Rajita, um, this other... Lahiru Kumara suddenly looks to be taking a step on, having promised a lot of potential for a while. And then, you know, there's someone else you can throw in, like Binura Fernando, who's got bounce. Uh, you know, there's other spinners coming through, like Dunith Welalage, who's come straight out of club cricket. Uh, Maish Texhana, who bowls, you know, um, kind of a Janta Mendes mystery spin. Uh, so there's a depth in that bowling attack, which I think certainly wasn't there um, or hasn't been there for five six years um, well, that, that's think... an indication that uh, uh, that's something that uh, all, all of us all of us who love cricket competitive cricket uh, and are passionate about the game and want to see some good competition out there especially in ICC tournaments then that's that's uh, that's a good news uh, uh, for the for the fans all over the world because people love as you mentioned that uh, a lot of people consider Sri Lanka as their second second team and and they would want to see uh, the Tigers, the Lankan Lions fight once again. Uh, no, absolutely. I think a lot of people want um, Sri Lanka to do well, right? And it's been, um, I think, upsetting in the same way for uh, as people found the West Indies decline in the late 90s, early noughties upsetting. I think seeing Sri Lanka go from, you know, being consistently challenging for world titles in white ball cricket to being back towards the bottom of the pile I don't think anyone has wanted to see that. Uh, you know, it's um, a great, colourful, characterful uh, island cricket nation. And uh, I think if they could find a bit more consistency, it would make the world very happy. Right. right. Well, uh, thank you, Nicholas. Thank you for talking to the print. And uh, thank you for the book. Uh, uh, that's all for now, uh, for our viewers. Uh, keep watching the print. Oh, thank thank you. you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure and I hope we can Same catch up again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.